Hello, and welcome to the Forbes and Square Small Business Virtual Summit, bringing Main Street online, building a web presence that sells. Throughout the event, you can connect with our speakers and each other via Slido. You can do so by selecting the Join the Conversation button, which can be found at the bottom right-hand side of your browser. You can access it via your mobile device by visiting slido.com and entering the code hashtag Forbes Small Business. Now, please join me in welcoming Manit Ahuja, Senior Editor, Forbes. Good afternoon, and thank you all for joining us, and a special thank you to Square for our partnership. Today, we're kicking off session one of our three-part series with a critically important topic, bringing, bringing Main Street online, building a web presence that sells. Over 75% of small businesses have needed to shift their operations and presence online and pivot their business model as a result of the pandemic. Our experts today and founders will tell you that this is especially an art versus a science. Kicking us off will be Katie Sweat, product lead from Square with a presentation focused on building your web presence. Followed by our panel discussion where Katie will join Square and Forbes Small Business Advisory Board members, Kelly Khalil of Loverly, Mahisha Dellinger of Curls, and Rachel Tiffograph of Micmac. During the program, we want to hear from you. Do not forget to ask questions in Slido, either via uh, the Join the Conversation button on your screen or by visiting slido.com. Let's now kick off an amazing program geared towards getting you the tools you need to succeed. Please welcome Katie Sweat, Product Lead, Square. My name is Katie Sweat, and I am here today to talk to you about bringing Main Street online, specifically building a web presence that sells. I'm a product lead at Square, and I help sellers get online and be successful with, an e with e-commerce stores. So as we know, brick and mortar businesses are the foundation of our local economy. This year has been a challenging year for all of us, but especially our brick and mortar businesses due to COVID. Buyer expectations of technology are rapidly accelerating, leaving many small businesses scrambling to catch up. Even with all of this innovation, our Main Street businesses are, still have a crucial role to play. I wanted to share some quick data to not only show how relevant physical locations are, but also how their relationship to the buyer is changing. In 2019, brick and mortar sales still made up 90% of total retail sales in the United States. 49% of buyers said that they still prefer to shop in brick and mortar stores. 50% of retail store visits uh, are to feel and touch the products before purchasing online. But how these customers are interacting is changing. There is a new front door to these businesses and it's online. Offline is starting to inform online and online is often being fulfilled offline. Buyers have so many choices and it's critical that your business is among them. So today we're gonna to talk about how your business can be augmented by coming online. 50% of customers say they expect to buy online and pick up in store. 71% of shoppers admit to using their smartphone while shopping. And 75% of Gen Z is expecting to return goods that they purchase online. But you might be asking, how do you get online? Do you have to pay thousands of dollars to a developer to custom code a website? It may feel out of reach, but there are plenty of options these days and we're gonna walk through a few of them. There are three main types of online presences, websites, which tend to be informational and give your buyers information about where your business is and when it was founded. Online stores, which are a version of an, a website, but allow your buyers to actually purchase uh, goods or services directly from the website. And channels, which are similar to marketplaces where buyers aggregate around and can discover new brands and purchase directly from you. Quick poll question, how are you currently selling online? Are you selling with your own online store, via marketplaces, via social channels, or do you have a website? Today, we're gonna to be focusing on your online store. And it's crucial at Square that we help our sellers understand the importance of owning their own online store. There's a couple key reasons. One, when you own your own store, you have creative control over your store. Um, you can iterate on merchandising, your products, 
uh, how you talk to your customers and describe them. And you have ultimate control over the vision and iterating on what your products look like. Second, you have control on price. With marketplaces, there are usually a commission fee for finding customers, but with your own online store, you can have control over your price and complete increase on margin. And thirdly, and most importantly, you own the relationship with your customers. I want to reiterate how important it is that you own the relationship with your customers. Unlike online-only businesses, brick-and-mortar businesses know their customers. You've talked with them, you've, had, you've helped them with their holiday planning, and you've given them suggestions. It's crucial that you choose a technology that helps you build that relationship with your customers and keeps the customer central. As you start blending these online and offline worlds, there needs to be a central source of truth, and that will be crucial for your ability to market to them and support them. Sadly, there's no one-size-fits-all approach to getting online. You have to approach this as the unique business that you are. We'll walk through a couple of questions to help you think through what you need. When, you, when it comes to an online solution. First, it's crucial that you determine the goals of your business. What type of business are you running? Do you want more repeat customers or are you looking for new customers? Are there products and services that make more sense online than others? You don't need to have your entire catalog online. You can pick a small subset that makes sense for your business. Are there competing businesses that are more convenient for your customers and why? The next question is how can you give your customers something special while making their life easier? Who are your core customers and what do they tend to need? Do you have a group of customers that is currently out of reach? What do those customers need? And lastly, don't just think of the extra revenue. Think about sustainability. After shelter in place and social distancing rules, sellers scrambled to get online, but they did so in a way that was often not sustainable for their business. Think about how you'll fulfill orders, manage inventory, report on taxes, manage shipping, and report on your business's success as you understand your options for going online, as this will be crucial to your sanity and the overall success of your online business. There are a million ways to start, and many people are paralyzed by choices. Once you understand that you need to be online and you've already dug into what your unique business goals are, you can start researching your options. Most businesses start here. They find a beautiful desktop website with an inspiring theme or even hire an agency, tell them about all the features that they want that will compete with their competitors. Um, and then the shock hits in uh, when they understand what it costs to build such a solution. But what if I told you there was a different approach? Let's flip the conversation from what you want and what you're looking for to what your buyers are looking for. And your buyers are on mobile all the time. Think about your own behavior. You likely remember the gift that you needed to buy or the dinner that you needed to order or cave to buy something on impulse when you're on your phone. So how does your business prioritize mobile and how does that impact your approach to getting online? Well, first, foot traffic in retail stores has declined by 57% in the last five years, but the value of every visit has nearly tripled. And you might wonder why that is. Well, the main reason is because buyers now have information at their fingertips, and this mobile experience is driving local purchases. Six in 10 shoppers say they start shopping on one device and finish on another. 82% look up information on their phone during the purchasing process. And the searches with the term near me have doubled in the last year. When we broke down these earlier stats, you can see that in 2019, we saw 48% of online sales were coming from mobile experiences. And we know that this is only increasing. So you might ask, why does this matter? Well, starting with the mobile experience creates a lot of focus. First, convenience matters when you're on a mobile device. You're likely multitasking and you don't have your full attention. So having clear ways to discover, pay, and fulfill are crucial. For payment, native pay options like Apple Pay and Google Pay are requirements. For fulfillment, lean into your local presence and allow same-day pickup or delivery. This will help you compete with the two-day shipping for Amazon and give your customers that immediacy they're craving. 
Second, mobile help focuses the user experience. The screen size being shrunk forces you to focus on what's most important. You'll have a one column view. There's less real estate on the page to add extra information. The performance or speed matters and it must be easy to navigate with large tap targets. Additionally, your phone is contextually aware so it can help your buyers or customers uh, find your store and get directions. Let's play along. Um, and if you grab your phone and open up your camera app, hold it up to the screen over the QR code, you'll see a push notification at the top. If you click that, it will take you to the Nike uh, category page that you can see here. And I think this is a great example of showing how branding can be simplified even for the best businesses. Um, you'll see on Nike this very simplified color palette and simplified user experience. When we talk about brand, and how that can apply to mobile, it really helps focus the conversation. You're no longer talking about flying animations and moving videos because on mobile, usually buyers don't have time to watch those. So focusing on your colors, your fonts, your logo, and your domain name are the crucial elements. But also think about how those are being applied. Think about the application of that color on the page. In the, Nike, in the Nike example, you can see pops of red, but in general, the page is very clean and simple. Use high quality imagery. When your customers aren't in store and they can't feel and touch your products, they need to have high quality images of what's available to them. Additionally, high quality interactions, which for example, if you add a product to cart, if you have feedback that says that you added that product to cart can be very helpful to give that customer a dynamic experience with your website. And lastly, the quality of the end-to-end -end shopping experience is often overlooked. Pretend you're a customer and go through that experience from discovering a product to purchasing it, to picking it up, and make sure that that's reflective of your brand. Just because you build these wonderful experience doesn't necessarily mean that your buyers will be able to find you without some help. So there are a couple of ways to get new customers. There are free tools and there are paid tools. And then there are tools that focus on new customers or acquiring customers um, or existing customers and retaining them. When we think about free tools, it's important to look at listing sites and uh, search engine optimization. Listings are free like Yelp and Google My Business and can help your, help your buyers when they're looking on their mobile device to find your location. Search engine optimization makes sure that your website can be discovered by Google or Bing or Yahoo. Paid tools uh, like ads, social media ads, or Google ads can be helpful um, in targeting new customers if you know exactly who you're trying to target. Um, so looking at those ads, lean into your local advantages and try to target people who are near your physical location. For existing customers, it's important to stay engaged with them as well. Oftentimes we forget about the existing customers and just run to acquire new customers, but that's actually a pricey game to play. So social media, blogging, and email marketing are great free ways to keep your existing customers engaged and coming back, as well as paid tools like retargeting ads and loyalty. Loyalty can be a great way to reward repeat purchases and keep your existing customers happy. Think about Sephora's rewards program that has been very successful at keeping people purchasing on Sephora. And in summary, take a step back. Don't worry about doing everything. Own your online store. Focus your efforts on what's important to your business. Choose a platform that'll scale and keep your customer at the center of the experience and lead with mobile and local. Thank you. Just a reminder to take Katie's poll in Slido. Tell us, what online channels are you using right now? A, website informational. B, online store transactional. C, social channels, Facebook or Instagram. D, marketplaces, Amazon or Etsy. Now, please welcome Mahisha Dellinger, founder and CEO, Curls. 
Kelly Khalil, founder and CEO, Loverly, Katie Sweat, product lead, Square, Rachel Tipograph, founder and CEO, Micmac, and moderator, Manit Ahuja, senior editor, Forbes. Awesome. Well, thank you guys again so much. And Katie, great presentation. Let's dive right in. You're all powerhouse figures in your respective industries, building businesses that have strong digital footprints, as well as brands that have seamlessly transversed from brick and mortar to online. So I thought a great spot to open up our conversation would be on building a strong digital footprint. According to a recent report from the Connected Commerce Council, small businesses that embrace, uh, embrace digital tools at the start of the pandemic can expect to see four times greater revenue than those that didn't. So what are some recommendations, and this question is for the whole panel, um, for the most, digital re uh, the most useful digital resources for small business owners? Katie, we can start with you. Yeah, there are so many um, out there these days, but I think, you know, as I walked through in the presentation, understanding what your core differentiator is, who, what is your business, what are you trying to solve, and how can you use technology to augment some of those experiences that you may have brick and mortar, or if you're starting, you know, digital first, really trying to understand how you want to differentiate. So I think looking at, you know, what that problem is you're solving for your business, there are a ton of different tools. Um, I would look at some of the name brands that you can grow into rather than always just trying to, you know, find a startup that kind of can meet that first need because a lot of times that second and third and fourth need come really fast with success. So trying to understand what the longer term platform is doesn't have to be more expensive, but thinking a couple steps ahead um, can be really helpful as you search for those tools to kind of meet that, that specific problem. Awesome. And for curls, um, our purpose and goal is to always number one, educate, entertain and engage. We have to do all those three things, the three E's, um, to captivate and keep our audience intrigued and also apprised to what we're doing. So we use a few different tools, one being the one we're on now, Zoom, which was a very useful tool for us to have so many creative and out of the box events from shark pitch tanks to give win $5,000 for their small businesses, to Curls Got Talent shows, to live tutorials, how to create, recreate hairstyles from celebrities, to doing um, uh, watching live events together or watching movies together and had popcorn and pizza delivered. We've done so many amazing events out of the box events using Zoom because you can collect the data, you can remarket to them later and also remind them and communicate and talk to them. So we fall in love with Zoom. So great choice today. And there are a few others, like we use social media like Instagram Live to do our focus groups and Facebook Lives and Facebook Messenger 24 seven support for hair care uh, assistance. So we, we've used a, a bunch of different tools. I would also say that it's really important to understand um, what channels and what uh, different platforms from a digital perspective are going to be most effective for your business. So um, there are so many that are out there. So if you don't yet currently have a social media strategy or a Zoom strategy or some type of content programming, this is the perfect time to kind of step back, take a deep breath and kind of get your um, toes wet a little bit and try different um and you don't have to be overwhelmed with having, um, obviously, uh, Maisha has this incredible Zoom strategy. You know, starting somewhere small is a great way to test and learn and, and choose one channel to begin with. Start with maybe updating your website or dabble in social media, but you don't have to do all of them at the same time. Because I know as a small business owner, your most valuable resource is your time. Mm -hmm. And so you don't want to spread yourself too thin. You want to make sure that you are focusing your energy where you're going to have the biggest impact and you don't have to do it all, all at once. And I think owning that in the midst of all of these channels and tools that are popping up to kind of serve the needs that we're seeing right now, just owning a way to have a communication or have open communication with your customers is just so crucial. So whether you're using Zoom to talk to them, whether you have your own website where you can communicate with them because you own that data, I would just kind of double down on how important it is to be able to have conversations as you would in person. Just now we're doing it digitally. So picking which one works for your business, there's 
a ton of different tools and depends on what your business is, but own that customer relationship and make sure you can learn and iterate and talk to your customers. It's not about coming up with a 50 page business plan anymore and just executing it for the next few years. It's really kind of rapid iteration and meeting your customers where they are. I and I would like to add, with, if I may, I'm um, sorry, go ahead. Oh yeah. Uh, I always start with what am I trying to solve for? And when it okay. comes with my customers, I live by one principle, which is that I want to give them more value than they give me. Mm. So if a customer is paying me $10,000, I want to give them $20,000 of value. Wow. In my business, which is e-commerce software, uh, my end user is uh, brands. That's who purchases my software. Mm -hmm. So I have to ensure that the knowledge that I'm giving them is more valuable than my actual software. So that's mm -hmm. what I'm trying to optimize towards. And then I fill in the blanks with content, like what content can I actually bring to market? How am I going to produce that with what resources? And I can tell you that the greatest thing that we've done is create digital community amongst my customer set right now. Mm -hmm. So if my buyer is a VP of e-commerce, during this time of the pandemic, I have connected VPs of e-commerce across the entire world. Mm. It's more valuable for them to learn from each other than from me. Mm. That's a great, great point. So Mahisha, Kelly, and Rachel, when you were starting your respective businesses, because we have a lot of people in the audience today that are at the beginning stages of launching a new venture and have had to pivot, what were some of your first steps with establishing a digital presence? What worked and what didn't? Wow. Well, I launched over 18 years ago, so it was quite different than today. Um, every... I, pretty much a dinosaur. So I think what MySpace was around then. Um, so it was really a different platform and different um, landscape. And I had to evolve into what came up as we grew into technology advancements. So initially mm -hmm. we were e-commerce space and had a MySpace page and obviously talked to people in chat groups. Um, but as things evolved and as we've elevated, then obviously Instagram and Facebook and all those different tools came about and, and the Zooms of the world. And so as they come along and as we see what worked best for us, we would adapt them. One thing I always say is you have to evolve or you'll dissolve. People who did not jump on social media uh, platforms with their brands and thought they can just do business the old way when social media came around, obviously found that they were behind the eight ball. Um, so it's really, but also another key point is not jumping on every single opportunity. Not everyone needs to be on TikTok. You know, so understanding what's right for your for your business and for your business structure. Um, mm -hmm. So for us and we're a beauty brand. So mm -hmm. we are speaking to women who want and love to take care of their curly hair, speak about it, the challenges and want to connect and see demos and see other people using the brand. So we picked the ones and the tools that were best suited for us. So that's interesting. You says pick the social media that appeals to your customer and that lends itself to your brand. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm hmm. Okay, great. Cool. I, I would definitely agree with that. I, when Loverly started, um, you know, we really focus on inspiring couples with great wedding inspiration and, and wedding planning content to help make wedding planning easier and more fun. That's our mission. So naturally, platforms like Pinterest, as well mm -hmm. as Instagram were great ways for us to actually inspire our audience, right? Because that's the type of visual content that brings them in. Uh, Mahisha bringing up TikTok is really interesting because we haven't yet migrated over to TikTok yet because it doesn't feel like there's an organic uh, crossover there. We never really got big into Snapchat, right? Um, and then, but as Instagram stories came out, we've actually been able to leverage, you know, those tools to engage with our customers in a different way. So I think it's really important to not get um, overwhelmed and kind of jump into something and go all in on all these new platforms. You really need to stay connected to who your customer is, how they're behaving online. And I think oftentimes we can get overwhelmed with the idea of digital marketing, brand building. You know, as soon as you get behind a phone or a computer, it's like, oh gosh, like, what do I say? And the reality is it's the same thing that you would say in real life to a customer who walks in your doors or someone that, um, you know, sits down at your restaurant or whatever it might be. If someone says hello to you, you're of course going to say hello back. So right. when you see someone on Instagram or on Facebook comment on a post or a photo and you don't reply, it's kind of the offline version of just 
you know, ignoring someone when they say hello to you. So those are, you know, I would say one of the biggest tips I could give when you're building a digital strategy, whether you're just starting out or, you know, you're 10 years or 18 years in is just really try to, um, connect with your customer in a human way and let the tools be what they are tools to facilitate those connections. Um, and I know it's overwhelming when you're like, Oh, there's, do I do the swipe up? Do I do the pull? There's all the noise that gets in there, but take a deep breath, take a step back and think, how can I connect with my customer in a way that I would normally do in real life if, you know, we weren't in this pandemic and we weren't on the Zoom call, right? Um, How would we do that? So just kind of keep that in the back of your mind when you're thinking through what is your digital strategy? How do you bring your brand to life online? I think I may interject and add something to that before we move Mm -hmm. on. Great point. And I was going to say it a few moments ago. When you're talking to your audience, remember the conversational tone. Do not, if you don't want to speak to them as a robot, robotic, right? If you say hello, you wouldn't say, hello, ma'am, how are you? No, hello, how are you? Welcome to Curls. We thank you for joining us today. Like have the, the tone that is appealing, natural and soft and not so harsh or, or, or boxed in. I think in the early days of building your business and your brand online, you as a founder or the founding team, you have to play into your strengths. So for example, for me, my strength is public speaking. I immediately launched a podcast. It was one of Mm -hmm. the best things that I did in early days. I'm actually terrible at taking photos. So I didn't build a visual brand. And Mm -hmm. I think it's really important to be super self-aware of what your strengths are as a founder and then build your digital presence around that. The other thing that we talk about how you communicate with your customers is there's also a data component. So when you're talking to them, you know, in text or in video, that's one portion. But there's also for e-commerce, like how are you communicating to your customers via marketing offers, right? Do you are you offering them the right thing for who they are? And so back to why it's important to own your data, it's because if you know who those people are, you can give them relevant offers. If you buy cat food every week from a store and they offer you a coupon for dog food. It doesn't make sense, right? So it it feels very impersonal. So I think as you think about how you extend your business online as well, making sure whatever personalization is kind of a fancy word and people will say AI and ML and all this this technology, but basically what it's doing is trying to mimic what you would do in person, right? If you know this person, if they're loyal to your brand, you'd give them a discount or you would say happy birthday or you would give them the fourth one free. And so really understanding, I think, how you bring that personalization that you have in conversations and when you meet someone in person to your e-commerce platform as well is also a really um, important way to kind of grow into your your e-commerce or digital presence, just so you're using data correctly instead of just throwing it out there and hoping, hoping something sticks. Right. So it sounds like all the great advice you guys are saying, it it sounds like this needs to be a strategy from day one, like a dedicated, um, just like you deal with inventory and supply chain issues, you're reaching your customers needs to be a priority uh, on the digital spectrum, whether you're online or brick and mortar or a combination of both and, and really hearing what they're saying and engaging with them. Right. I think it's important to have a, a digital strategy for sure, but I think the reality is with small business owners, there's not a lot of time, right? And I, and I keep bringing back this super valuable resource of time. And so, you know, especially as in the middle of this pandemic, as there's so much change, I would say don't take on too much. And there's always an opportunity to start and try something new. Mm-hmm. And instead of having thinking about it as a strategy, I like to think about it as a framework. How am I approaching email communication? How am I approaching my my website messaging? How am I approaching any online advertising or my customer support, right? If you think about every single channel, you don't necessarily need to have a flushed out strategy for all of them. But if you have a framework for how you're going to approach it with your tone, how quickly you're going to respond, you know, how, um, willing you are to solve the issue, whatever it is, if you develop a framework, it doesn't matter what platform you're on, you'll be able to figure it out on the fly. I do want to share one bad story so everyone can learn from my mistakes here. 
Okay, I, great. Go for it. And then we're going to head to so our full results. In the early days of building my company, I ended up pivoting. And I share this because I was too public too soon. Mm. So if you're still figuring out who your target customer is, don't go big so quickly. It's wow. really important that you have confidence in your product and your target market before you overinvest in your digital presence. Because if you Google Micmac enough, you'll start to see a totally different company from the past because I was too public too soon. That's a great, great, great advice. advice. <laughs> hmm. Great point. All right, let's head back to our polls. What online channels are you using now? And we had our audience select all that apply. A, website for informational. Uh, B, online store, transactional. C, social channels like Facebook and Instagram. Or D, marketplaces like Amazon and Etsy. And it looks like the overwhelming winner at 93% are social channels. So to your point, guys, um, finding the right social strategy, um, that's the right way to go to see where the customers are at. So I wanted to uh, jump into my next question. I mean, this is such such great content here. Um, but some of the, the major pain points that business owners are feeling, especially now in the pandemic, is access to capital. Mm -hmm. And with limited resources and major overhead to consider like payroll and supply chain issues, how would you advise founders think about prioritizing and allocating resources towards their digital strategy. So basically to boil it down with a limited budget, where can they find the greatest bang for their buck? And, and I know you touched on some of this in the earlier question, but just to reiterate for, for those that, you know, only have a certain dollar amount allocated for this. I would say if I may begin, um, definitely for sure your digital ads that you can build, bid on and have a daily budget. And you pull away that budget that you would maybe spend on going to lunch and and your in your Starbucks and and maybe you're not you know you're not going out and your entertainment budget goes away for the you know first six months or seven or eight nine ten months. But start allocating a percent of what you bring in and you can own how much you spend with the bids. But you have to invest in those digital ads because they will number one top middle. To, at bottom of the funnel will bring those customers to you as long as you're ready um, and have you give you the ability to remarket to them. So definitely, definitely, you definitely have to use or find a way to siphon some money out of that budget to mm -hmm. start even on the smallest, smallest amount, because it's going to get you the access to your customer base. Mm -hmm. I think uh, paid media is an incredible tool, but for someone who's starting out, who's never spent anything on Facebook or Instagram or Google, um, it's very much a, a learning process. And so you oftentimes won't see a return on investment right away. So it can be a little bit riskier if you don't have a nice chunk of change to spend against it. 100% agree with Mahisha. You can you know, put bid caps on there. You can spend a little bit per day, which is actually, if you're just starting out, in my opinion, the most valuable to capture data and to learn what's driving your customers through your funnel. But if you don't have a lot of dollars to spend to get to an ROI positive model, what I would suggest is look at what you do have. So are people coming to your website? Are they, um, what's your email list look like? Do you have phone numbers for your customers? Uh, what's your social media presence look like? What can you do with what you have, right, to kind of jumpstart and test maybe new promotions or new offers? So I love digital media, sorry, digital uh, paid media, specifically if, um, you know, you're familiar and, and you're using it for data, but just starting out, I have seen, you know, when I launch a new product, it usually takes three to $10,000 in marketing spend to really start to see a return on investment. So I just want to level set that so people understand, because if you go and you throw a hundred dollars on an ad on Facebook and you see nothing, don't get frustrated or disappointed. You know, it takes a certain amount of time to train, you know, your Facebook pixel, your LinkedIn pixel, whatever platform you're using. And so um, if you don't have a couple thousand dollars to test and learn and throw at it over, you know, a four to six week period, work with what you have um, and get creative. The first step that I would take, and it's piggybacking here, is calling your best customers. 
Mm-hmm. Like it's all, it's everything is about in the early days, figuring out product market fit as fast as humanly possible. Mm. So for my business, you know, I was going after literally everyone under the sun. I was selling goldfish for $2.99 and professional camera equipment for $2,700. After having a year worth of data, I was able to figure out where's the Delta, which customers are actually sticking with me or even like upselling or repeat customers. And then once I zoned in on who that customer was, now, again, I'm more in a higher price point item. I sell enterprise software, but if anyone who sells any item, I would say above $50, I'd do the same thing. You call your customer and you understand where they're spending time. So in my business, there was a few marquee conferences. So it was actually about me physically getting on a plane and going to those conferences to find more of them. And then leveraging customer testimonials to get that endorsement so the people that are like them would trust me. And mm. so the That's whole so thing is, yeah, it's get to know who your end customer is and literally call them. Love that. yeah. That's great. Yeah. Especially if you're on a budget, it sounds like. Mm-hmm. Um, so for businesses that already have an established online presence, what additive options would you recommend if, you know, they already have a social media presence, they're by, they have some native advertising, they have a little bit of a budget. What can they do right now to get that extra oomph to kind of take them to the next level? Well, I love what Rachel said. I think that this is a perfect time to reconnect with your customers because behaviors are changing really quickly, right? This is a new world of how people are consuming content, how they're shopping, how they're, you know, browsing online or whatever it is. So I think that it's a unique opportunity, even if you have all the dollars in the world, to um, actually reconnect with your customer and see how they're doing now. and and get reconnected with maybe where their behavior is changing so that you can then allocate your resources in that way. Mm-hmm. One other tip I would say is, you know, a lot of the big platforms, whether it's, you know, Facebook and Instagram or Google, they're always rolling out new features and products on their platforms. Mm-hmm. And what I have found in personal experience um, with Loverly is, you know, we reach almost 700,000 on our Instagram channel. And we have a second channel we launched that has, you know, close to 70,000. And whenever Instagram launches a new product, like Instagram stories or reels or whatever it is, they tend to favor the accounts that are spending more time using those new features because they, they want to also learn. They want to get data and feedback. So they're going to reward those who participate in them. So if you do have extra dollars or time, you know, maybe this is an opportunity to experiment with parts of existing marketing channels that you're using, let's say Instagram as an example, to maybe double down or try Instagram stories or reels if that type of content translates for your business. Might not translate for Rachel's business, probably will translate well for Mahisha's, right? So it it really, it depends again who your customer is. But I think um, exploring the current platforms and their new features is a great way to explore and learn. Just if I may also, oh, go ahead, go ahead. I was just going to say really quickly, going off of the talking to your customers piece, I do think right now, um, because so much is changing, if you talk to your customers and you understand not just what they want from you, because sometimes if you ask them, what do you want, they'll give you a very specific solution that, you know, you might have a way better way to solve their problem. Um, so I think really diving into like what problems are you experiencing or what's happening in your world will actually give you a lot more information than a survey that says, what do you want from this brand, which may be a little bit more solution oriented rather than focusing on the actual problem. And I think there's just so much opportunity to innovate right now that like looking at the actual problems that they're experiencing, figure out, figuring out how can I solve that for them in a better way than maybe the alternatives that are available that they might actually be asking for is, is a kind of crucial uh, step right now for any business. And I want to interject and add that depending on your brand and what kind of company and service or product you offer, um, recent data show that while people really are still listening to reviews, mm-hmm. they are starting to question the validity of the, the macros, the big influencers that mm-hmm. are promoting brand after brand after brand. So there's been a shift in movement to micros. The micros are ve- way more engagement. 
um, more trusted, small audience, but you can do more with the micros if you're starting as a brand new company because they won't require most of the time payment. You can give a micro influencer you know, a set of products and give them products and they'll feel like they're building along the way to become a macro and will grow with you. And you can pick the best ones with the best engagement, with the best um, aesthetically pleasing images, with the best um, look that goes with your brand and and have a, almost a better ROI with the micro influencer. So we have not only the macro, midi, but a lot of micros as well that now we're working with. So that's something to consider that will not cost a lot of money to get you going and get the word out about your brand. That's so insightful. And so Mahisha, my next question is for you. You're in a really unique position where you're online and in retail stores that were deemed essential during the pandemic. But at the same time, hair care is really nuanced and personal. You're either a person who's in charge of your own hair care at home or you go to a salon. Yes. So how did you use your online platform to connect with those customers? You know, maybe the ones that are more the at-home hair care or, or, and also the salon ones, because they probably take two different approaches. Actually, like I mentioned earlier, we got really busy during uh, the pandemic and really turned our, went from having three to four events, physical events a week, because we had, we have influencers and street ambassadors all over the U.S., Mm-hmm. We went to, we shifted from physical to online events. And so we, we created events to, as we were going through that tough emotional time to do the Sunday self cares, where we'd actually talk about how to pamper your skin and your hair and, and home, home care DIY recipes, along with the curls reparative mask. And mm-hmm. we went from that through the tough emotional time to the fun comedy shows on Zoom, to mm-hmm. the Curls Got Talent shows, to the, you know, let's redo and recreate this look. So we we took them along the journey of let's make things as you're going through this emotional uncertainty to kind of help soothe it. Wine with Mahisha night. That was really fun. When we all brought our cocktails out and had Q&A with me. We just yeah. found ways to get creative and just decompress together but educate, entertain, and engage. Always those three E's. And so we found ways to do so along every step of the way for every single week since, what, March. Oh, that's great. I love those those three E's. So Kelly, you mentioned that small business owners in the event space should leverage this lull to lay the framework for a powerful digital strategy. What questions should they be asking themselves as they repivot right now? Yeah, so it, it's a really interesting time for uh, any small business owners who basically their business is based on events. So all 2020 weddings were either canceled or, or cut in half. And um, so we find ourselves with a lot of extra time because we're not out executing. This is the perfect opportunity to think about your digital presence and your brand. So mm-hmm. the kind of questions that you might want to be asking is, how do I appear online? right? Something as simple as when I Google my business name, what shows up, right? What does my actual website look like? How does it look on a mobile phone? Um, You know, what are the other touch points in the events industry? It's highly visual. So Instagram is a really important platform for that. When you search my name or my business name, what shows up and really take a step back and think of it not as you know, I'm the business owner trying to figure out where my customers are and what they want and all of the um, potential nuances of how they might find. Literally go through the process as if you are the customer or do a little uh, poll with your friends and family, right? Like how do you guys, you know, look for XYZ, a caterer, a photographer? Um, The other thing about the events industry is that it's highly referral based. So while you're going to do some quick Google searches and maybe read some reviews and read some blog posts, a lot of it is a word of mouth, um, you know, type business. So how during this time, during this lull, can you be connecting and engaging with other professionals who might be able to refer you business in the future or who knows, connect with them for the sake of connecting to learn, to kind of expand what's possible for your business and connect with the intention of not trying to get something or gain something out of it, but really to collaborate and to, um, you know, build a relationship. Because I do think that specifically in 
in the event industry, it's very much relationship based. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that translates online as well, right? You can support your um, fellow uh, caterers or florists or colleagues by liking and commenting on their, their photos or engaging with them online. That's a great way. But I, I still think there's a lot of power in the offline connection. Mm-hmm. So you mentioned something really interesting on our call yesterday. So I want to quickly get to that before um, we switch over to Rachel. But so you said that you're at your t- highest traffic since the pandemic, correct? But that doesn't necessarily translate into profit right away. Can you talk to us a little bit about that and, and the patience that's required um, during this time? Yeah, it's interesting. So as 2020 weddings were canceled, a lot of panic ensued with the couples that were using our platform or reading our content. There's a lot more time to do research. There's replanning, but a lot of um, transactions not going to happen today. We Mm -hmm. primarily on Loverly have been ad supported for the last, you know, two or three years where we work with brands to do integrated content. A lot of those brands pull dollars in fear of the pandemic of not understanding Um, where things were going to shake out, right? So while we had this increase in traffic and demand, it didn't necessarily um, translate on a one-to-one to to dollars. Mm -hmm. However, it is an incredible opportunity for us to have conversations and engage and start to understand our customers better. Mm -hmm. So during this time, instead of focusing on where is that return on investment right away? It's how can I go deeper with my customers? How can I understand them more? How can I create more value for them? And by focusing on that, um, we actually unlock some pretty incredible insights as to what people are looking for from a product perspective, what they're looking for for wedding planning tools. And so our team over the last six months spent a lot of time rebuilding and building new wedding planning features and tools to support them. Do the dollars happen today? No, but they will eventually over time come in. And so it's that, you know, you have to kind of weigh the benefits of um, of understanding that with business, sometimes you have to play the long game, right? Where you might not see things pop right away, but if you're doing the right thing and you're approaching things with a framework that makes sense, um, you will over time see the win or see the dollars. Good point. So Rachel, Make Mac is an e-commerce acceleration platform that has focused on small businesses since its inception. We're moving into the holiday season. So could you tell us for those who have created a digital strategy, how they should navigate translating sales and engaging customers um, online uh, now that we're heading into this holiday season? Yeah, I would say the number one thing to optimize towards this time is inventory. What we're finding is that when our clients' inventory is out of stock, consumers are putting competitor products into the cart. And if Mm. you're a mass consumer product, whether it's beauty or food and bev, alcohol, the behavior now online is just to hit replenish, replenish, replenish. Mm -hmm. So it's really a game of first to basket and protecting your place there. So Mm. number one thing is inventory management. And then number two is really harnessing all of this first party data that you're gonna be capturing during the holiday season to bring you into 2021. You know, one of the things that's been overshadowed for all the obvious reasons is that we're gonna experience some major challenges in the ad tech and e-commerce industry come the year 2022. In the Mm -hmm. year 2022, cookies are gonna be eliminated on the internet. Mm. Cookies is essentially the thing that allows you to remarket to customers with a pixel whether it's a Facebook pixel or a Pinterest pixel. And so everything that we're all doing today to drive a consumer from inspiration to purchase is going to get infinitely more challenging in the year 2022. I'm not saying that these things are not going to happen anymore. They're totally going to happen, but you're going to have to pay to do the things today that you do for free. You're going to have to pay Facebook more. You're going to have to pay Pinterest more. You're going to have to pay Google more, Apple more. So I say all of this. Because between this moment and the year 2022, it is the cheapest day to build up your customer database, your CRM, your war Mm -hmm. chest of first party data and Facebook ad manager. Mm -hmm. So like what we continue to see is that consumer demand for products online are at an all time high. You know, Mm -hmm. I've been doing e-com for the last 20 years of my life. And I used to tell people, if you want to drive sales online, You have to buy bottom of the funnel media, meaning you would go into an environment like Facebook and optimize your media towards 
conversion event as opposed to awareness. You don't need to do that anymore. During the pandemic, people are in a fear state and they need your products. So you actually can see amazing conversion rates in awareness-based media. So what I'm saying is go all in, capture all this first party data, Mm -hmm. really invest in customer relationships in 2021 because Mm -hmm. things are gonna get a lot harder in the year 2022. Wow, we felt things were hard now in a pandemic. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So Katie, you mentioned in your presentation that for so many business owners, they're often paralyzed by choices, but that mobile definitely be a top priority. What's the most cost-effective way for businesses to launch a mobile platform and marketing strategy? And Rachel would also love your thoughts on that question too. Yeah, I think as I mentioned a little bit in the presentation, mobile inherently focuses you as a as a seller. You're starting a business. And if you focus on desktop, there's so many choices. Um, you have a lot more choices in terms of how your brand is displayed and you know where kind of what you can do in terms of content. But I think when you start to realize how many of your customers are actually viewing your business on mobile first, you know, we're seeing upwards of 70%. Um, you really start to focus in on what are they actually seeing? Where am I investing my time? And what are they actually considering when they're making a purchase? And a lot of times those things aren't the same. Um, You might think that they're looking at some big animated video with a cool cursor, which is a beautiful um, and also important if you have kind of the money and the time to make sure that that looks great um, from a brand presence perspective. But if they're looking at your um, website, just for an example, or e-commerce store on a one column grid on a iPhone seven, um, which could happen, even though a lot of us have more recent ones, you know, it's, it's all condensed down and it's very, very small. And so it's kind of the, I always equate it to the old school remote controls versus the Apple T- TV remote. Um, like you can condense down and you have to get the most important pieces functionally working in a way that's really easy and elegant and beautiful. You're not not necessarily missing any core functionality. You just have to be really thoughtful. So I think it's cheaper, um, but it definitely takes more of your time to focus on mobile and say, what are 70% plus of my consumers going to see when they land on my online store? And is that what I want them to see? Because if you start on web and you start on desktop and you pay a designer or an agency lots of money to make this beautiful, um, huge uh, website, and then mobile is an afterthought, you're just not doing yourself a service and you're actually putting your money in the wrong place. So Mm -hmm. I just always suggest start with mobile and think about if you're a buyer, like we've mentioned so far in this panel, um, you know, what is your experience? You land on the website, some places like Kelly's business, you want to discover, you want to spend time there. Right. So that's a different, that might be different than maybe Mahisha, if they're landing on your website and you want them to purchase something that they already know that they want, um, what is that experience going end to end? And what does that look like on mobile? Um, I, I imagine, or I promise you that you'll create a different experience if you start on mobile than if you started on a 27 inch, you know, Mm -hmm. MacBook display. Um, and I think it's a good way to focus in a time where we all need a way to cost cut and, you know, bigger return on investment. Great. Well, I just have one quick follow-up question and then a final question to the group. And I want to see if we can quickly squeeze in some audience questions. So Katie, what was the number one mistake that you do see with businesses as it pertains to mobile interface? Um, Focusing too much on content. I think every business and every uh, seller, as we call them at Square, but you know, this group could probably attest, there's such a story behind your brand. And a lot of times it's hard to put yourself in your buyer's shoes and figure out what they actually need to and want to hear in order to make that purchase. And you want to share all of this rich information about why you're different and where you came from and what you've learned. Um, But sometimes that can be misplaced. And so there's just, there can be a plethora of content that overwhelms a buyer. And when you look at what marketplaces or really big brands might be doing well is they have copy editors and teams that are like, no, buyers don't need that information. Mm -hmm. And so I think taking kind of a an editing approach to, you know, how you portray yourself and really putting yourself in your consumer's, you know, shoes and say like, what do they want to know? What do they need to know? And how can they learn more if they want to is a really helpful way to pare down the experience that they'll see. 
Awesome. So final question to the group, and then I really want to hop into some, we have some great audience questions. So let's just consider this like a lightning round. If you could leave folks here today with one piece of advice as they begin their digital marketing journey, what would it be? Uh, um, let's, yeah, anybody op- jump in. Optimize towards your top performing customers. Okay, cool. Measure if your customers want to refer your business to their friends. Great. If, if you're brand new and you're just in the starting the game, make sure that you start, I mean, at the top of introduction of your brand, that you start to own your data um, and you make sure that you collect it every step of the way. That's going to be important. As you just heard earlier about 2022, it's going to be very challenging to own your data. Got it. I would say, don't be afraid to fail or make a mistake. Just try it. Amazing. Okay, so we're going to hop into some audience questions now. So the first one I have is, I'm getting views and website clicks, but not many sales. Any advice on how to change that? Thank you. Yeah, um, the first question I would ask is, is this quality traffic? Because if people are clicking and not buying, you might be going after the wrong customer set. That's number Mm -hmm. one. And then if you feel strongly that you're going after the right customer set, then I would argue that the content on the page is not leading someone to buy. Do mm. you need more client testimonial, customer reviews? Is the imagery not clear? Should you be showing the product in full compared to a size of a hand? Like there's a lot of tips and tricks to drive someone down the funnel. But my first question to you is if no one's converting, you might be going after the wrong customer segment. And you have a lot of data at your disposal to understand where they're falling off. Like, are they putting items in the cart and then noticing shipping is very expensive? Um, Or are they not at all landing on the product page um, and they're not putting the items in the cart? So I think there's nuance from like landing on the website to not purchasing um, that can give you some good insights. There's also some great tools that you can install on your website um, that actually record customers' um, going, checking out through your um, experience. And that's a really great way to see, is something broken? Um, Are they confused about something? Are they hesitating? Um, Again, that allows you to effectively optimize if the product experience or the checkout experience is not up to snuff or something's broken. That's great. Well, we only have four seconds left. So I'm going to thank you all for an amazing panel and all of the great uh, tips and insights. I personally learned a lot. I feel like I could start my own small business armed with all of this great uh, data and insights from you powerhouse um, business owners and founders and, and Katie, you at Square as a product lead. So thank you so much for these great insights. And um, yeah, I thought it was a great panel. Um, And thank you to Square for partnering uh, with us on these key messages to our powerful small business community. As a reminder, these events are one of many. Our next event on November 13th will be refining your marketing roadmap to attract new customers and scale. And on December 1st, we'll be hosting a panel on banking on your business, getting and keeping your financial house in order. That's all for us today, folks, and we look forward to seeing you at our next event in about two weeks.